So good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming on the uh, Custom Build Homes podcast. It's not how we usually do it, but um, we're all self-isolating, staying healthy, I hope. And what I want to talk about today is the effects of COVID-19. Um, what are we doing to try and mitigate any disrupt uh, disruptions to our business? But also, what does um, life look like after the pandemic for Custom Build? Is it actually an opportunity um, to look at housing slightly differently. So, um, for the, first of all, I'm Tom Connor. I work for Custom Build Homes. Um, we work in partnership with landowners and local authorities uh, to bring forward developments where people get to design and create their own homes. <clears throat> I'm joined today, uh, first of all, Hester. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm Hester. I work for Custom Build Homes. I'm their marketing, um, work in the marketing department. Perfect. Um, Alan? Hi, thanks, Tom. I'm Alan Corfield. I am owner and director of AC Architects. Uh, we are specialist self build and custom build architecture practice that work on projects across, across the UK. I also speak and write for Home Building and Renovate magazine. Perfect. And Jason? So I'm Jason Orm. I'm the content director for Home Building and Renovating. And as Alan just said, we, um, we're the leading website, magazine, um, and event. Um, provider for the kind of self and custom build sector in the UK. I've edited home building and renovating, been involved in it for 20 years um, and have built and renovated my own home a few, a few times as well. So um, give loads of advice to people to do it and hopefully, you know, class as a bit of an industry expert on, on how to build your own home well. Perfect. Um, so Jason, it might be a good place to start. Uh, we know in terms of um, how how the pandemic's affecting work how how is it affecting life at home building and renovating and what are the contingency plans that you've that you've put into place well a, a bit like you really obviously it's you know it happened very quickly um and as a result you know it, it, i think only really this week we're beginning to get a sense of actually what we can do to provide advice you know so our, our primary mission really is to provide ideas advice and information to people looking to build their own home and we ran, in, in usual times, we sell magazines, we run exhibitions, and we produce content for websites. So it's only really the last one that is affected by that and actually has, has had some growth. You know, obviously, so we've had to postpone uh, home building renovating events that we were going to run. You know, actually, last weekend, we would have had our biggest one of the year. And obviously, there's not many people going into Dubert Smith at the moment to buy magazines. So, you know, as a, as a result, getting the, the you know those ideas out there has been a challenge. And actually, we're in the process of launching this week a new thing called Homeschool, which is an web. You know, we'll do video chats. We'll provide online Q and As, and actually, kind of just shift that kind of content laser to people who are doing exactly what we're doing right now, which is sat at home in a fairly cold home office. And, and, and talking into a laptop. Yeah. Okay. And do you think do you think there'll be anything from the changes that you've made, working from home and doing more stuff online? Do you think it will completely revert back to how you were before, or do you think there'll be learnings and and things that work that come out of this that actually you'll you'll keep going with? Yeah, I think. Well, yeah, I, th I think you're right, and I think kind of as with any big economic shock, actually, and I think it happened in 2007 as well, actually what was going to happen anyway just seems to happen quicker. You know, so actually you just get that kind of accelerated process of, 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 of structural change being driven by this, which is effectively kind of the equivalent of a weather event in many ways. So, mm -hmm. you know, what will happen, I think, is that, you know, from a business perspective, we will obviously begin to prioritize more and more digital content not that we weren't doing it anyway but we'll just kind of focus more on that because that feels kind of fairly bulletproof and also feels like the way that people are going to get more and more used to getting that information and obviously things like video as well so you'll get you know more and more people i think kind of wanting to communicate in those ways and probably if we're honest maybe you know thinking twice about wanting to be in big exhibition halls with with other people for at least in the short term you know equally you could say that actually you know after 12 weeks self-isolating just with a dog, you know, you kind of want to get out and, and meet people again, you know, but I think inevitably you will get accelerated change to the kind of things that we all knew were going to happen anyway. Yeah. Okay. Al Alan, how's it, how's it been for, for you guys? I mean, I, I hear you're loving Great fun. being in the house. <laughs> and, and whatnot. Yeah, it's stuck in, so, so, <laughs> we made the decision, um, two weeks ago now to shut the, our permanent office um, and all start working remotely. So we had done 
a bit of work in the background so that we had new servers and all these different things so everybody could work remotely. I had been very hesitant from the past couple of years about staff working remotely. So that's one thing that's now changed from it. So um, prior to this all kicking off, we were looking at expansion and loads of different interesting things. And part of it was how do we have staff in England working remotely? And this is now tested and proven that we can do it. Um, I'm in the house with an uh, um, 11-month-old who has had coronavirus and a four-year-old who has chickenpox. So, like, I'm, <laughs> I want to laugh, get out. Too, I can't, we can. I mean, they're, they're, they're great. The boys are brilliant. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're good. And I think we've got another week of full uh, isolation. So actually not being able to get out to a shop or anything has been, has been a real lesson as a family group and, and how important our home is like to us and being able to facilitate have space to get away from each other you know all these different things that you need to that you need in these sort of strange strange situations and also knowing that my team or our team is working and continuing to work while they can and that's and, and having the tools to be able to do that so and you, you guys are are midway through extending your office <laughs> for buildings yes. oh God, off and off so, so actually we have we have a really nice shiny um, double the size office that was finished last Friday. Oh, it is finished. Painters right? were in, they finished it. Um, it's stunning, it's absolutely amazing and I don't think we'll be in it for another 12 weeks at least. Um, so it's the irony of that and I think I spoke to my landlord and said I don't think we need it anymore now so you can just uh, you just keep it, we're all just going to work from home um, to see how much we can cut our costs. But yeah, we will have, that's one of the things that's keeping me sort of sane and what's going forward is that we will have this lovely new space for um, the team to move back into but it is quite it's quite ironic really yeah so. well at least it's finished and at least the the boys are healthy so that's good Esther, oh yeah exactly how, how are you finding um working from home i know that you'll probably be missing me like crazy in the office but um how are you finding get, getting on with projects and, and progressing some of the stuff that we're doing at custom road homes without the sort of immediate contact of people next to you um i prefer it to be honest like I can have like uh, calls with um, our designer. It, I don't know. I just find it more. You can say what you want to each other. It's more private. And I feel like you can progress your work quicker. Um, but I do miss that like contact with like people in the office. But I am also enjoying working at home as well. So I think going forward, I think flexibility might become a part of custom build homes. Yeah, I think I think from a marketing point of view, it's it's throwing up quite a lot of interesting questions about about housing and about how people are having to actually live in a home. I saw Al- Alistair Harvin, who you might be aware of on Twitter, saying um, that every new build, house builder and developer should ask themselves, would you live in it for 12 weeks before they try to sell it? Um, which I think is quite an interesting... The answer would be no. I'd imagine, <laughs> I'd imagine a lot of house builders might go, hmm, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I actually would. So um, if we... M- moving on... Um, how do you feel new build particularly? I appreciate not everyone lives in a new build, but new build particularly, how do you think it's performing for people under the strain of um, a lockdown at, at the moment, Jason? Well, I think it, it means for what, you know, what type of new build you actually mean, really. I think you know, when, you, when you look at the kind of mass-produced developer houses on estates that we all know and, and love, um, ironically, I think you know you look at that kind of very very standardised format that they have. You know the kind of the three and a half bedrooms and all that kind of stuff, and you realise actually that that may well suit some people, but actually doesn't suit everybody. You know, and I think you know we've got what five people, four people on this call who are all in different circumstances, all need different things out of their houses, and, and all like different setups in terms of flexibility. So. You know, when it comes to that kind of mass-produced, standardised approach to house building, A, it's obviously actually quite unique to the UK that, you know, the more you travel around, the the more you see other ways to to create housing. And actually, I think the more that you realise that, particularly in times like this, when, when, you know, our houses are under pressure in a way that they've never been before, I mean... God, you know, we spend so much time in houses at the moment that it's just unreal, really. And you really begin to understand what houses need to be and how they need to work for you. The, I think the more you realise the folly that somebody else could prescribe that for you, you know, in, in a way that is just assumed rather than controlled. And, you know, when I think about 
what housing should be and actually what I think people are going to want at the end of this. I think that word control is really important, you know, and I think, you know, we, we have no control over so many things now, don't we? We've got no control over when we, when we can go to the shops and no control over where we can walk our dog or whatever or where we can where we can work. The one thing you've got control over is basically what's within your fencing, effectively what's within your, you know, in your garden, in your house. And so if that's all you can actually control, you know, in life, then I think people will demand that more and more going forward. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think one thing that I've noticed is, <clears throat> yes, I'm cooped up in the house. Um, we're on lockdown, so to speak, and we can go out for essential things and, and whatnot. But actually, when we don't have these restrictions put on us, we go everywhere for everything all the time. And actually, we don't live in our houses. I've noticed anyway, I, I, I go to work, I come back, I eat, I sleep. Um, and, then I, and then I repeat that, you know, leave the house, go, go to, you know, the gym or to, to work or to see friends or whatever. And actually, over this period, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm very fortunate. I live in a house that's been designed um, for a family and individually designed, and it works very well for us. But I'm I'm just thinking about the <clears throat> that mass-produced product that you talked about the the four-bed house where two are box rooms and suddenly you've got you know two people working full time in a living room with trying to homeschool kids and noise you know my my um, mum's a counsellor and you know trying to have private conversations uh, is is quite is quite difficult for her so. Um, you know, I do feel that people will realise that there are that they don't have to go out the house so much, and therefore it might drive a demand for their house to work better for them. No, I, think, I think that's right, and I think you know what's also been noticeable. I think for most of the people I've been speaking to who live in houses that they've had control over, whether that's you know through they've renovated it significantly, or whether they've had it built for them. Mm-hmm. I think the one thing that they always speak about is a the, the niceness of being able to spend a lot of time there, you know, but also you know, the importance of, of kind of, I guess, kind of being self-sufficient, you know, and, and actually I've quite enjoyed the fact that we haven't had to go to the shop every day or, you know, you, you actually use it, what's in the freezer and all that kind of stuff and, and make the most of it. I've actually quite enjoyed that spirit because I think I'm generally pretty tight as a kind of, as a, as a northerner and I kind of just don't want to spend that much money really. But, you know, yeah, we've you got stopped people, Jason, so. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm lavish compared to you guys. Yeah. But, you know, I think generally speaking, I think people are kind of just wanting to take um, a bit more enjoyment in the time that they're getting, you know, because obviously we're getting a lot more time now as well in that we're not commuting. Um, and as a result, for many people, at least despite all the economic issues, of course, a relatively positive experience if their houses are nice. Whereas if they're in, you know, it sounds awful to say, but if they're in a kind of small flat in a city centre, can't go out, yeah. you know, or stuck in a small townhouse on a new estate with a tiny garden then you can imagine that that would feel quite imprisoning, you know, in a way that look, those of us don't suffer from. Well, that's something that... Uh, Sorry, Alan, on you go. Yeah, just jumping on that, that's something that I was going to add in that's been vitally important. We, we're like serial renovators and we've got a relatively nice house and it's an 80s um, build in a, in a housing development, one of the better ones, but we're on a corner plot. So we've got... a decent garden and that's been the one vitally important in this thing is being able to get the boys out and do loads of different things in space and that's I think Tom you're probably going to allude on to people history you in a city centre environment where you can't get out and do that as, as easily so it's, uh, yeah, that's been vitally important for us Hester how are you finding city centre life not without the bars and the clubs and, and everything are you still are you managing to cope uh, yeah, my bar is right there. <laughs> I got my music over there. <laughs> got my, t- my cinema right there. Uh, the only thing that's wrong with, with my flat is we don't have a garden. So you feel kind of more isolated that you don't have somewhere you can just pop out. Whereas other flats, they have a garden in the middle of like their yeah. development. But I think being in city centre, I think flats should have that. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of speaks a lot, doesn't it? I think people, one of the things that I think people are now thinking about in a way that they weren't even three weeks ago is actually what they get when they buy a house. You know, so they don't just get the house, they get the land with it or the lack of land with it in your case. Yeah. And I think, you know, people will increasingly think about the position and the location 
and the setting of it, as well as just buying, you know, a, a house for the home cinema room or something like that. Yeah. And Alan, um, you know, we've talked over the last year or so about how do we turn individually designed housing in whatever form into a mass market product? That's kind of what, what we want to achieve. And I think anyone in, in, in custom and self-build or, or just sort of housing for, for good wants to, wants to see. How do you feel working with an architect will benefit, um, will benefit people in terms of creating something that actually does work for them um, in times like this, but also just sort of, you know, improves their everyday life when, when we don't have the restrictions. Yeah, I think it's vitally important that it's not just and not sticking just with architects, good architects and good designers. If you're walking, working with somebody to design a home for you, that's the thing. We're, we're, what we are producing in the, the UK is um, poorly designed and poorly thermally efficient or not thermally efficient houses. We're not designing homes. The stuff that we do in self-build and custom, we've done 340 odd self-builds now. They are designed to that person's requirements. And if those people that are sitting in their home right now, it's part, it'll be designed for them, perfectly for them, not for a mass um, generic um, household. Um, and that's a massive thing. And if we can start bringing that to become the norm, we're going to have better quality homes that people can use um, now, five years' time, ten years' time, so they've got a future home, they've got something that's that's tailored to their requirements. So a couple of examples of that, we are, a lot of the stuff we do at the moment is, or for the last couple of years, has been open plan, kitchen, living, dining. If, if that's the only space you have at the moment, you'll be hating it because you need somewhere to escape. You have to have that dynamic. And if you've not got, so in the house that we're currently in, it's a four-bed house, one of the bedrooms up until a year ago when we had our, our newest child was a, a home office. But we wanted to retain a spare bedroom for family members to come. So that's now a spare bedroom. So I am working in a conservatory and I've had to move up here into the bedroom because it was too light. So I couldn't do calls. So mm -hmm. part of it is great. We've got separate spaces we can use, but they're not fit for all of the different things that we now need to do because the dynamic of how we're using houses is changing because we're we're in it more so if that if this house had been designed from first principles we would have had a specific office that was designed for both myself and and my wife emma's requirements so um, and that's what you get when you deal when you when you first speak to customers then mm -hmm. um on on a custom build development or mm -hmm. someone looking to build their home what are the types of questions that you're asking i mean for from a <clears throat> from a home buying perspective People go on right move and they look up number of bedrooms, where do they want to live, and they look what's on the market. Whereas, you know, from speaking to some of your architects previously, I get the feeling that it's much more of a personal how do you live your life set of questions, and then the, the design comes from there. Can you tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we were very guilty of maybe five or six years ago having a very prescriptive brief that we asked room sizes different amount of rooms, what do you want to do? We now tailor it completely different um, to what are the, the, say, the four or five things you do as a family now. What are your main activities? Um, a lot of them will be, um, so prime example in the house that we've got, we, I travel a lot very early in the morning, so we've got a master bedroom, dressing room, and an ensuite. I can go from the ensuite en back into the dressing room and straight back into the hallway. I don't have to come back into the living room. So I've done that through thinking about how we need to live. So I don't need to go back in and wake my wife up for a second time. If you go through these processes of thinking, how do you live? And it could be as simple as, well, the kids are coming home from primary school now. What do we do at half three or four o'clock with them? Do we all sit around and make dinner around uh, an island unit in the kitchen? Um, are we outdoor people? So a lot of our clients are, the younger ones are more outdoors. So they, they want a double garage that they can drive in, wash the bikes down, that's connected into a, a wet, dirty utility room with a shower in it. So you can hose the bikes down, come in, hose the kids down and put the, the laundry straight into the stuff. So, But these are things that you get from designing a home for you. So there's four or five questions you can ask people about how they live now, how they live in five years and how they might live in 10 years. So it's really important that we're designing homes for now, but also for how the, the future will, will develop, whether it's multi-generational, Again, if we're all stuck in lockdown with other members of family, how do we actually do these things? Mm. So that's that's what you get when you're designing a home. Perfect. And Jason, you've actually done it. 
you've designed and built your own home, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I kind of um, built from scratch, and, and the one that we're in at the moment is as good as probably a bigger project, really. It's a, a big renovation remodeling scheme extension, but it was probably a bigger project than the self-build we did in many ways. And, and we were a bit like Alan, really, kind of just really thinking about how we wanted to live in five or ten years rather than necessarily thinking about now. And we've got two kids, kind of pre-teens, and we, you know, I, I kind of grew up in a very, a really nice house, but a very small bungalow. There's an only, only child with mum and dad, you know, and I think that kind of experience means that you kind of really value space quite a lot more than you would in another <laughs> one. And um, I, I was kind of just obsessed by making sure that, you know, as the, our kids went through their teenage years, they, if they wanted to bring friends over, that there was a space for them to do that. Or if, you know, there was always going to be an area that, you know, Sarah and I could go that was quiet away from kids, you know, and, and I think, those kind of thought processes and the ones that Alan, I think, really well, you know, described really well there, I think exactly the kind of things that every single person really wants to go through, you know, and, and I think that, you know, to your wider question about how do we make custom build a more kind of mainstream pursuit, you know, I, I don't know anybody who wouldn't want that, you know, I mean, we, you know, we design and, and kind of take control over so many aspects of our lives, you know, we personalize our iPhones, for God's sake, you know, we don't, yet yeah, we don't have that same approach to our, to our houses, you know. And I think what this process will do is just a give people a significant amount of extra impetus to take on control of their homes, you know, their, their home sort of life and the way that works. But also, I think begin to think very clear, carefully about, you know, the way that their lifestyles change as well. You know, so you know, we're going to get more work in at home. You know, we're going to get probably more time at home. So you better well make it good. You know, and, and enjoy it and take control. You know, so so the processes that I went through when I was designing, you know, the last one and this one really were future proofing. You know, thinking about performance because the other thing I haven't really talked about yet is actually the thing that is under most pressure in most people's houses is broadband capacity. You know, <laughs> when you got two two kids with Disney Plus, you know, and, and me trying to do Zoom meetings and so on, then you know the actual performance of the house itself in terms of those things is really beginning to be pushed. You know, so. There's just a hell of a lot of things to think about when you design and, 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 and work on a house. And as Alan will know, you know, I've, I've kind of shared at home building and renovating shows, you know, good and bad experiences I've had with designers over the years. But actually, you know, what it teaches you is that good design and a good design experience is just critical to it. Because, you know, the consumers, you know, your, your customers and, and, and the likes of me and the people that we, we write content for on, on, on the home building site, they're people who, do, who are doing this for the first time, you know, and they probably won't, won't know what they're doing and probably won't do it again, you know, so and they're going to be spending probably tens, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds. But, you know, they really should use experts to help, you know, and, and, and people like Alan, you know, who are good designers. Alan, you never get that. It's been recorded. I'm going with that. <laughs> well, it's on record, that one. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. But, but, you know, but good designers are absolutely essential to making that kind of that, that thing work, that lifestyle conversation work, really, because most people don't know really how to start it. Yeah. And Alan, that performance of the house, can that, is that something that's, um, that's thought of quite early in the, in the design process, or should be? Yeah, it should be. I and mean, a lot of the stuff that we do in terms, I mean, broadband. Is uh, provision is an, is something that we t- we all take for granted, but actually having something that's stable that there's got capacity is not that's not something we would overly be looking at. But the the thermal performance is always massively look, looked at, and how we're getting the most of the, the 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 natural sun and and all of these things. One will help save the planet, but will reduce your outgoings. And that's a lot of the things that we're looking at when we're we're working with self builders or or people that are building custom build sites is that by doing using renewable tech or or going for something like the fabric first approach where you're 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 getting the forever bit of the house right and reducing everything cost wise thereafter that's reducing their outgoings forever more. So actually, if they are borrowing, they've got um, th- their outgoings are reduced, so they've got more capacity there. So there's 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 lots of different tech and renewables and, and performance things that we need to think about that will help our day-to-day life and reduce our, our costs, which is something that we're all going to have to think about moving forward. And being being self-developers, for want of a better word, <laughs> yeah. you know, we have, um, you know, if, if you were doing a custom build, self-build project, you will be retaining some of that developer profit for yourself 
and therefore it's easier to access those types of materials that, that, are, that do cost a little bit more, um, but will give more back to you in the end. I think one of the issues that we have certainly in scaling it will be how do we, how do we convince the developers to spend a bit more and create something better that, that ultimately isn't always recognized in the value of what they're selling. So understanding that if, if we can create service plots, for example, then there is opportunity at scale to, um, to build to a higher quality and, and be more thermally efficient, etc. Would you, well, you agree with that? I think as well. I know, Alan, that, was, that question was for direct well, to you. Good, Jason, you go. I'd say it anyway, in, in a true journalist kind of fashion. Um, yes, you know, of course. <laughs> I think what you'll get is, is the market develops is competition. And I think ultimately it's, it's competition that will ultimately result in what people want. You know, So choice and competition kind of go in equal measure, really, in many ways. And what people don't have at the moment is, is, is either, really, actually. If you want a new house in this area, you've got to go and buy something off that estate down the road. You know, So, you know, once you get... I think once you free up the land supply and you get you know big companies selling off service plots, then I'm all for all the builders that we know and love, you know, and, and they're the names that you, you see time and time again in the home building and renovating shows. They should all be competing with each other to build houses on their sites, yeah. you know. And and, and I mean, God, it was it was like years ago, but early early February, I was out in Australia, Western Australia looking at the housing model out there. And it's just like that. You literally go on to what looks in many senses like an unbuilt housing estate, but the plots are bigger and a bit nicer. Um, and on the, you know, you go to the main sales centre and near the sales centre, there's a, there's a road and it's just full of individual builders who've built show homes. You can go in, you can meet the designers, they can tell you how much it's going to cost you and you can pick your plot and they'll go on and build one for you. It still takes 12 months to do. But you get the choice, you get the control of it, yeah. and and it's just absolutely ordinary out there, really. And it, I just, I'm kind of the more I think about it, the more you just realise how bizarre it is that we don't follow that model. Yeah, it's, I mean, very similar in the in the United States. Um, I lived out in New England for for quite a while, and um, we worked on on sites where, just like you say, the instead of a show home, there was essentially a, a design centre where there was multiple contractors that were um, design and build companies. There were some architects that, that would only do design and then contractors would, would cost it and, and build it. But, you know, essentially you're driving around uh, a housing development with some houses that are either being created, have been created. Um, the ones that have been created, the boundary treatment's finished, so it's a finished product. Um, and then the, the the overall developer has a requirement maintaining the landscaping until someone buys that plot, they strip it back and they start building again. But what we what you get at the end of it may take two or three years, but but so will a volume house uh, builder site here. You could, you're only going to get so many people buying in one place at one time. Um, but what you get is rather than a hundred homes of four different house types, you get a you get a hundred homes of of individually designed housing, some level of cohesion, as you would expect in materials, scale, etc. But um, all working for people. And I think the effects of coronavirus in places like Massachusetts, South Carolina, Perth, Sydney, Queensland, you know, in, it, it won't be felt in the family, in the household, like it's being felt here. I think that there will be, and, and probably because they're quite they're quite willing to spend more time in the house. When I lived over there, you know, you didn't you didn't need to go and entertain yourself out with your house because actually you designed leisure time, you know, into into that property. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think you know the outcome of this, I think, is that we will see a huge upsurge in interest in people taking control of their homes. You know, to put it in general terms, at least, and. You know, clearly the industry is developing. It's still at a kind of nascent stage, but the work that you're doing and a few other companies are doing, I think, will help bring that to the mainstream. And I think they'll be. It's all driven by demand, really. As soon as you get widespread demand and it's and it's achievable demand, mm -hmm. then I think you'll see it really begin to become a the mainstream option. You know, and that will happen in a few years. I'm convinced of it. Yeah. So if it's demand-led housing, Alan, what do people need to do? Get a get question right. Get onto the right to build register. 
Yeah, exercise your right to build. You can register with any local planning authority in England and they have a statutory duty to permit enough plots to satisfy that demand. Um, currently, 50,000 people, I think, was the last the last count um, in November. So hopefully that's gone up. And if we can use this opportunity to grow demand, then you know we do stand, I believe, we stand a good chance of making some fundamental change in the, in the opportunities that people have. Jason says competition and, 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 and the choice that comes from that can only benefit people, I'd, I'd say. Um, thanks very much for, for coming on. We're going to run out of time in a couple of minutes, but before we go, um, Alan, uh, Jason, where, where can people see you next? Um, what's happening with the, the home building show and, and uh, how do they get involved? In it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, obviously the home building shows are on a, a brief hiatus. As you might imagine, spending loads of time in an exhibition centre isn't ideal when they've all been turned into big hospitals. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that will, that will come up on stream, obviously, clearly. Um, but we're all focusing on delivering the best of the exhibition experience on a little bit more of a digital experience at homebuilding.co.uk's home school, um, which will be launching in the coming week or two. Um, and we're delivering loads of interesting content for people stuck in their houses, dreaming about building their own home. Yeah, well, share that stuff with us so we can get it out to our, to our databases because I think that's a great idea. Um, I'll take your word. Alan, you've, uh, you usually speak at the shows, yeah? So yeah. when they do well, come I'm, back, people can get tickets from you, apparently. Is that right? Oh, yeah. We've got, we can, we've on our newsletter on acarchitects.biz, you can sign up for our newsletter and you can get um, two free tickets for each of the shows. There's a link on there. Um, and I plan, I think me and Jason will have a further chat about this, but I hope to do some of the talks that I delivered. Certainly the ones I did, we, we managed to get one show. Uh, the Farnborough show was done at the, the start of this year, which was a great start. And um, we were all excited about going through the rest of the year. And it's obviously, as Jay says, it's been put on hiatus. But I hope to deliver those talks in a digital format, which would be something that we can look at and get them get them out. So design, talk on wow and design, um, energy efficiency, and a couple of other things we can, we can get on. So, yeah. So, well, guys, we're going to run out of time in about 40 seconds. So um, thanks very much for, for coming on. And, um, yeah, good luck. All the best with it. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Stay safe. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Cheers.